Welcome back, Rocketeers! I'm Charlie Garcia, and this is my series on building a bipropellant liquid rocket engine. Diving right into it. Last episode, we discussed why I selected a pintle injector, and how I would size the elements of the pintle injector. In today's episode, we're going to discuss how we design all the parts that make up the pintle injector, as well as going into detail on the face shutoff sleeve that will allow us to control propellant flow into the combustion chamber. Warning! Pneumatic systems can store large amounts of energy, Always ensure you have a safety first test plan and the proper protection equipment when you're working with high pressure pneumatic systems. We need to CAD several parts today. I'm going to be working in SOLIDWORKS, but any CAD program will do. Fusion 360 is currently a popular free alternative. Let me know how you feel about all the CAD in today's video. This is much closer to my actual workflow, so if I can do more videos like this, it'll be a lot easier on me. This CAD footage is me recreating the parts that I've already designed. I did this to get good video of CADing the parts, but also for a few other reasons. I've omitted some dimensions and features from this CAD in order to make it clean for the video, but don't worry if you see it jump between complete and incomplete CAD. The detailed version of the CAD is what I'll be using to build the engine. Situations like this will decrease as the videos catch up to where I am with the engine. Alright, let's get started. To design these parts, I'm going to create a new assembly in SOLIDWORKS. Next, I'm going to create a sketch plane in the assembly and begin drawing out all of the cross sections of the parts. I'm dimensioning everything relative to each other, with the most important dimensions added first. This way, that if I modify one dimension, it'll all propagate to the rest of the parts in the engine. It might take a little more time to set it up this way, but believe me, it's super helpful if I have to make a design change later down the road. Okay, so there's a few parts here. First, there's the pintle body, the long cylindrical element. Then the pintle tip, the bit that closes out the end of the pintle body. Followed by the pintle sleeve, that goes around the pintle body and slides up and down to control fuel flow. Then there's the pintle seat that the pintle sleeve sits on to control fuel shutoff. And then finally there's the topper, and this hat is going to locate the pintle body inside of the annular orifice as well as provide a pneumatic chamber for me to open and close the face shutoff sleeve. Now that I've completed the sketch, I'm going to create a new part and reference the sketch at the assembly level. This way if I make changes at the assembly level, they'll all propagate to the individual pieces of the engine. After I copy in the sketch, then I revolve the sketch around the central axes of the part. For some parts, like the pintle body, I need to add other features in the part level. For example, here I'm adding the cruciform support structure. Notice how I forgot how radiuses and diameters are related and accidentally made the fillets twice as large as they needed to be. Just as an aside, fillets are really great for machining parts. They let you use end mills to get down into the parts without having to come back and machine them from a different angle, and they reduce stress concentrations, making your parts less prone to failure. After I complete the pintle body, next I need to complete the same process for the rest of the parts. Most of these parts are literally just straightforward revolutions. The pintle sleeve, though, has a ton of extra features. The pintle sleeve might be one of the most important parts in the engine. When the pintle sleeve is all the way down, it covers up the oxidizer injection slots, and blocks the annular fuel injection orifice. When the pintle sleeve is all the way up, the engine is at full throttle. For the first version of this engine, I'm going to pneumatically control the pintle sleeve. If I implemented electronic or hydraulic control of the pintle sleeve, I might be able to throttle the engine. But for this first version of the engine, that's too much complexity. In order to perform its function, the sleeve needs to have geometric features that cover the oxidizer slots, seat against the annular fuel injection element, as well as have features at the top to enable me to pneumatically lift the sleeve. The inside of the sleeve also needs to have a seat for a really big spring and several seal glands. The spring lets me bias the sleeve to be normally closed, so that way if everything on the engine fails, it just shuts down. There's a lot of possible designs for the pintle sleeve, but I've chosen one that's easy to implement and even easier to machine. I've also accidentally added another really nifty feature. Because of the shape of the pintle sleeve, it gets an assist from fuel pressure pushing up on the bottom of the sleeve. The increasing fuel pressure helps to counteract the downward spring force on the sleeve. It's not enough pressure to open the sleeve, but it is enough pressure so that the sleeve can't open without it. This means that the engine will never start unless the back of the pintle sleeve is fully wetted with fuel. This will make it more difficult for me to hard start the engine. A hard start is when there is a lag between when the propellant enters the chamber and when it lights. This means that there is an excess amount of propellant inside the chamber, so when it does light, it detonates. The oxidizer shutoff is really straightforward. When the sleeve slides over the pintle body and pintle tip, it blocks the oxidizer slots. This does depend on a tight tolerance between the sleeve and the body, but that's just a machining problem. Now let's talk about the fuel shutoff. This is a really tricky metal-to-metal -metal seal. This part needs to hold back several hundred psi of fuel pressure. This isn't the first valve I've tried to design in my life. My last attempt leaked for months through several design changes and was generally a very painful problem to debug. Originally, I was going to machine the pintle sleeve and 3D print the seat for this valve into the metal combustion chamber. I've since decided that this is an awful idea. 
Because the combustion chamber dome is a $2,500 part, this will hopefully save me a lot of time and money later in the design process. Going back to the sleeve, the shape of these parts controls what the throttle response of the engine is to the Z height of the pintle sleeve. For example, if we make the oxidizer slots in the pintle tip taller, it will take longer for them to be fully uncovered, and therefore longer for full oxygen flow into the chamber to occur. This makes the startup process slightly slower and softer for the engine. We can do the same thing for the fuel orifice. By making the relief angle on the pintle sleeve less than that on the pintle seat, we can make the fuel startup process take a little longer and get a softer startup on the engine. This design choice has the added benefit of increasing sealing force on the seat, making it less likely that this part will leak. Speaking of pintle sleeve preload, now we need to size the spring. Spring force follows a really simple equation, that the spring force is equal to a spring constant times the length of the spring minus the natural length of the spring. That spring constant is called the k-factor. We want a spring with a low k-factor. We don't want the force required to move the pintle sleeve to change much as we move it from the bottom of its stroke to the top of its stroke. We still need a really large initial force on the spring though. To get this, we want a spring that starts off really long with a low K factor, and then squish it down a lot when we push it into the engine. I'm still trying to figure out exactly how much spring preload I want on the sleeve. If you know of any good poppet sealed design guides, please link them down below. I'd love to give them a read. Now that we have the sleeve closed and the propellants are not leaking, we need to open the sleeve so that we can start the engine. This is a really straightforward feature to design. All we need to do is add some area at the top of the sleeve that we can expose to pneumatic pressure. We can use this area like a piston and use the pneumatic pressure to pull the sleeve up. The area we need this feature to be is simply the spring force minus the lift assist we get from the fuel pressure divided by the working pressure of the pneumatic system. We'll also add a nice safety factor to cover any friction or other unforeseen forces the sleeve may experience. I'm going to be using a COTS valve to actuate the pneumatic pressure for this part, so then I also need an AN fitting to connect this part to the pneumatic system. I've been thinking about doing a video on fittings, tubes, and pipes for a while now, so let me know if you'd like to see a special on flared fittings. So, let's recap. Gas will come in through this AN fitting here, then push up on the pintle sleeve, opening it and allowing propellants to enter the combustion chamber. That is, unless the gas goes somewhere else. Gases, and in fact any fluid used in rocket engineering, are notorious for being anywhere except where you need them to be. If you give them the tiniest opportunity, they'll escape and complicate your life. To keep gases and other fluids where we want them, we use seals. Seals come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and types. For example, earlier we were discussing metal-to-metal -metal seals, but now we'll be discussing elastomer seals. There's a few critical leak paths we need to stamp out. First, there's a leak path between the chamber and the vented side of the hat. Hot combustion gases following this leak path could either overcome the pneumatic force keeping the pintle sleeve open, or worse, erode these two parts, locking the pintle sleeve in place. To prevent this leak, we need to put a dynamic sliding seal on the inside of the pintle sleeve. Seals are pretty straightforward to design. You put an o-ring with a nominal set of dimensions, and then you make sure that the o-ring is slightly compressed when you install it between the parts. By squishing the o-ring a little bit, the rubber rubs up against both parts and makes good contact, preventing gas from leaking past. There's a really great resource called the Parker O-Ring Handbook that tells you exactly how much you should be compressing a given O-Ring for a given application. I'll be using that design guide for the rest of this video. Next, there's a seal on the pneumatic flange of the pintle sleeve. If this seal doesn't work, the sleeve won't lift and the engine won't start. This is another dynamic sliding seal, but it's a little larger than the internal one. In a similar vein, there needs to be a seal between the hat and the top of the combustion dome. If there wasn't a seal here, the pneumatic gas wouldn't pressurize the cylinder very well and we wouldn't be able to lift the sleeve. This is an even easier type of seal design called a face seal. And basically all we have to do is crush an o-ring in between these two parts. Finally, we have a really critical seal in between the fuel channels and the pneumatic cavity. If this leaks, the pintle sleeve may be unable to close and the engine might not shut off correctly. I wouldn't be able to do a controlled shutdown if something breaks, or if I deplete one of the propellants. This is another high pressure radial sliding seal, so I'm going to design a separate part to hold this seal in place. This also makes it easier to install. Alright, that's all the seals sorted, so now we can think about the startup sequence. When you start rocket engines, you normally start them oxidizer-rich. After a few hundred milliseconds of operation, you shift them over to being fuel-rich, where they're a little more efficient. You burn this way for the main stage of combustion, and then you shut down a little fuel-rich again. This protects your engine components from a hot, oxygen-rich environment. If you want to get really fancy, you can add an inert gas purge after engine shutdown to cool everything off and help clean out the engine. Wow, another 10 minutes gone. These videos go by so fast. It turns out there's a lot going on inside of a rocket engine to talk about. I've seen everyone's comments on the previous videos saying I'm speaking a bit quickly, so I'm trying to slow down for this video. 
Let me know if that helps. I'm also still time and money constrained making these videos, so I'm exploring other options that will let me make longer, more in-depth videos. Next week we'll be designing our first test fixture to hold the Pintle flow test element. If that goes well, hopefully the week after that I can start cutting metal. I probably have several dozen hours of machine shop work ahead of me, so let me know how you'd like to see that presented. I don't have a camera person, and time lapses are tricky to set up, so I'm looking for a good option to show you all the work I'm doing in the machine shop without having it be a burden on my actual machining. I also have a surprise video coming up sometime in the next two weeks. It's going to be a really cool side project to show off, and I think you'll all enjoy it. Alright, I'm done teasing future work. Now it's time to sit down and execute on all of that. I'll see you next week on Liquid Rocket Engines. So until then, good luck and Godspeed.